all for tuning in. I'll be presenting my work on RNA 3D design and how to leverage RNA's unique properties as a biomolecule to generate an infinite number of RNAs for therapeutic and uh, bioengineering applications. But first, let me, let me get you as excited as I am for RNA 3D design. Uh, since graduate school, I've really been intrigued by the next generation therapeutics, or ones that do not use the common strategy of small molecule inhibitors against proteins. There are many new strategies coming out that offer us the ability to target specific proteins and pathways that small molecules have not been able to. These strategies use various design mediums, but the class that really caught my attention are RNA-based therapeutics that in the past few decades have started to gain traction. You might be wondering, why RNA? Well, RNA has many useful properties that make it an excellent design medium. It can easily be produced and can fold into the complex 3D shapes that perform catalysis. Here are two exciting examples that really illustrate my point. First, on the left, uh, we, ha we have a, a transactivating ribosome, which can cleave a specific mRNA sequence. In this case, the mRNA of vascular endothelial uh, growth uh, factor receptor, or uh, VEGFR, which is key in the development of new blood vessels. Because it's been shown to downregulate uh, VEG, uh, VEGFR in, in vivo, it's currently in phase three clinical trials to treat advanced kidney disease, uh, cancer, uh, as blocking the generation of new blood vessels can significantly slow down tumor growth. In addition, on the right, uh, we, have, we have the recently FDA approved macugen aptamer, which inhibits uh, VEGFR1, uh, another uh, VEG uh, receptor, to treat wet macular degeneration which is caused by abnormal blood vessels forming in the eye that leak blood. Uh, both, both of these are really great examples of what can be accomplished with RNA design, but I really do think this is for, uh, just the tip of the iceberg. Let me show you a hypothetical design that I would really like to make. First, let me explain the basic concept. The idea is to have a general framework for detecting different cellular agents using GFP as a reporter. The framework consists of a self-cleaving ribozyme that upon cleavage yields a five prime end with a star code on, so GFP can be transcribed. Thus, the, the system links the cleavage of this ribozyme to the production of GFP. Modifying the rate of cleavage based on ligand binding can lead to a gradient of GFP production based on affinity or concentration uh, of a ligand. For example, one can modify the sequence of this construct so it can bind a target M uh, microRNA. I'm specifically interested in uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, HCM, the leading cause of death in young adults, which has been known, uh, which has known key uh, microRNA indicators. This is a totally doable project. It follows a similar strategy of conditional ribosomes based on small molecule binding, which have been already developed. Uh, see references below if you're interested. But this would probably take years to work, uh, to figure out how to work, to optimize the contract so it can be used in vivo but I think we can still uh, add more complexity. Rising calcium ions is also linked to HCM, so we should probably detect that too. And now we've left what is possible to accomplish in a reasonable time frame with current methods, especially if we want to make this work in vivo. It's usually possible to get a design that works in vitro, but once you move it in vivo and it doesn't work, you might not know why. This all wouldn't be a problem if we can design these quickly and in a rational manner. If instead you could produce thousands of potential RNAs and then try them all, then it might be possible to find a working one quickly. This gets me to the other key advantage of using RNA and why it's a great design medium, which of course brings me to Lego blocks. Uh, who hasn't played with Legos as a kid? I spent a great deal of my childhood building all different crazy things. But now as an adult, I'm really struck by their true simplicity. Each block isn't much by itself. Uh, and there, there aren't m many blocks, or there used to not be very many. Now there's quite a few. Uh, yep, combining them together gives rise to a, a really complex structures. Um, it's really not just uh, static structures either. There are plenty of Legos that can move, shoot toy lasers, etc. And they're all based on this idea of modular buildup of simple structures to give rise to complexity. I really feel this is a great analogy for RNA, as there is evidence to suggest that this type of structural and functional modularity exists in RNA 3D structure. In the past decades, it's been proposed that RNA might fold into discrete modules uh, det uh, determined by secondary structure topology. 
So though it is known that RNA is flexible, it might not be a terrible approximation to assume that the lowest three, the energy structure of each motif is like a Lego block. With helices as structural support, junctions modulating the orientation of adjacent helices, hairpins serving as tertiary contacts, and points for a protein binding. Um, and then there are functional elements such as small molecule binding aftermares, which are key for re uh, regulatory riboswitches, and catalytic sites where backbone uh, catalysis can take place. Excuse me. Um, this all like sounds good, but like what is the what is the evidence for it? If you take if you take a given secondary structure, say the kink turn, and find all 3D structures that contain this motif, overlay them, you see that they're virtually identical, even though their local environments um, might be different. You can see this again on the right with the sarsen ricin loop, which is a large number of non-canonical base pairs, yet each independent structure is virtually identical. I could show you even more examples, but I think this illustrates my point. There are definitely some motifs that, given a secondary structure, always yield the same 3D structure. So uh, if a large number of motifs follow this principle, then solving design challenges should be as easy as connecting motifs together, like Lego blocks. We call this motif assembly, and a proof of concept of this has already been developed by Luke Yeager and colleagues, who have demonstrated that this is indeed possible uh, with some motifs. Um, so, uh, excuse me. Um, but uh, as you can see, this is only using a, a, a small number of motifs to build uh, some simple geometric structures. Um, the problem is, though, although this is powerful, it still requires a lots of expert intuition and trial and error. Um, also, although this work is inside, no useful structures have uh, yet been developed with it. I think there are two reasons uh, for this. First. Uh, you need a much larger number of uh, set of motifs uh, is required to build something that's useful in the real world. And the second, the process needs to be automated um, uh, and automated uh, and quick to build uh, new therapeutics that I'm really interested in making. So here's uh, the two question, uh, two things that need to be answered, and I, will, I think I'll address them in my talk first. Can we expand uh, out the palette uh, of 3D, uh, 3D RNA modules from a handful uh, to thousands? And is there a way to automate the motif, the motif assembly process uh, so it produces rapid and numerous results? If we can answer both of these questions, then I think if we return to the uh, HCM sensor I proposed earlier, I could easily build thousands of these using the software I'll discuss shortly, but again, uh, we don't know which motifs are modular, but if I did know this, I think it would be re uh, really easy to get uh, tons of solutions to this problem. So first thing to do is we need to find all motifs that could be potentially modular. So I took the entire PDB set of crystallographic structures uh, under 2.4 inch of resolution and found all non-canonical sets of residues flanked by Watson and Crick base pairs in each side. Uh, but now you need now we need to figure out which motif is modular in a high throughput way because there's there's hundreds of these uh, using using uh, using sequences from motif uh, I don't have my I, the pointer doesn't show for some reason um, uh, the way we're going to do this is build a, a a sequence of motifs from one side of this tetra loop uh, tetra loop receptor tertiary contact. Uh, as seen in the center. Uh, why use this search contact? Well, it's easy to test uh, for its formation using shape chemical mapping. The shape uh, region modifies the ribose sugar of RNA only when the uh, shape region can have access to the O2 prime hydroxyl. So it's correlated to whether the residue is base paired or not. Uh, when this tertiary contact is pro uh, pro uh, properly formed, the residues are protected from shape, while when it's not formed, they will not, it will not be reactive. This gives us a high throughput way of checking to see whether the structures we build are roughly uh, forming the uh, structure we think. So here's an example. If we mill the model, the red segment is, uh, the new red uh, segment is shown in, the red new segment is shown in red, um, on the, uh, seen on the right side. Uh, 
then we perform shape to see uh, uh, sorry, this is also cut off. Uh, pour, uh, perform shape to see if the blue uh, to, to see if it's protected. So you can see in blue, uh, blue is not reactive. So uh, in this case, we, we would say that this works because we're expect uh, the tetra loop tetra loop receptor. If it's blue, uh, if it's not reactive, we think it's formed. So this roughly suggests that our uh, model is correct. Um, then, then if we um, if we produce another again on the right, the red is uh, the proposed structure, and then um, sorry, the left is the proposed structure, and then the right is the shape. Um, then you could see in this case that the tetra loop receptor is uh, reactive, and on top of it, the shape uh, of mapping does not map, uh, match the expected secondary structure. Okay, so this is how we're going to be testing them, but how are we going to generate because we have uh, all these constructs? And as I said, there's uh, going to be a lot of them because there's lots of different motifs. So the trick is to automate the process. I have developed RNA make, which uses a a star search to build a path uh, of motifs that can satisfy any design problem. So on the left shows you what a traditional 2D A star search looks like. The goal is to find the surest path uh, from the red point to the green point. Uh, the open circles are points it's considering where the shade uh, shaded points are uh, points that's visited. We can, uh, can use these same principles when making a path out of RNA motifs. Um, where instead of circles, I mean now using motifs, and, and as you can see, I have the same boundary issues as I cannot build uh, over existing RNA. So using RNA make, I'm able to build hundreds of thousands of constructs, which, uh, but, init but for initially for testing purposes, I've only made 16. So you can, uh, you can see the huge diversity of possible solutions that were found. Um, so in gray is the scaffold, the tetra loop, a tetra loop receptor, which is the same in every construct, and the red is the RNA uh, RNA make design scaffold. Um, so you can see there's huge diversity for possible uh, solutions I found, but which ones end up working? So as I said, we're using shape chemical mapping, um, and 11 out of, uh, out of the 16 yielded tetra loop receptors that have a high level of protection, uh, which uh, suggests that it's forming the structure I, I think they are. Um, but to validate whether our designs are atomically accurate, ac accurate, we're collaborating with Jeff Keefe's lab in UC Denver, which is making great process in getting crystal structures. Um, also to point out, three of the 16 uh, did not work. And you can see in the touch loop receptor, there's increased reactivity. Uh, but of course, this comes back to the, uh, to the question, which of the motifs are good and which are bad? We need to somehow take this data and figure out exactly which motifs are good to use and which ones or not. Um, so uh, here's the strategy that we ended up going with. Uh, we can use simple linear algebra to get a so-called modularity uh, scale for each motif. Uh, we can do this by recording which motifs were used in which construct, and then if the tetra loop receptor was formed or not as a marker for success. And then we can apply, uh, apply the traditional mx uh, equals b uh, and solve for x, which should be a ray of the same length of number of motifs. So um, in this top example, I'm just illustrating, uh, it has three motifs, and then uh, the top row would correspond to that uh, to that construct. And I color-coded where, um, if we say that's motif one, two, and three, that's uh, where they would uh, be in the, first, in the first row. So if we do this, uh, we, uh, we get um, the scale, uh, and we believe these numbers are related to how likely the motif is to be in the confirmation observed in the crystal structure. So I'm not sure of the significance of the numbers yet, but I can highlight a couple examples which back up this model. So if we first, uh, there we go. If, we, if we first look uh, at the second highest uh, one, this is the HCV domain uh, 2A, which are actually has already been used in RNA design. Uh, uh, Thomas Herman and colleagues uh, cut out the uh, HCV domain two, uh, which is this bench structure seen on the uh, bottom right. Uh, they then using uh, self-assembly, they were able to attach four of these together to make a square. And then you can see on the, uh, on the far right, 
they that is the zoom in of what the con uh, what this domain looks like in all four uh, corners, and you can see although it varies slightly, it has the same overall orientation. So to see that this is um, that this scores highly, uh, I think highly agree, uh, agrees with this because we already know that it seems to behave in this modular fashion. Then looking on the other side, uh, we have a P4, P6, uh, J5, a J5A, which on the other hand, um, there's only one example of this uh, motif in the PEB, and it's most likely a hinge. And um, under, under functional constraints, it might be unable to form this modular structure since its job uh, is not to be a stable bend, but it might uh, be in these two separate conformations, which might uh, be contribute negatively to um, its, uh, its stability. So I'm just going to quickly summarize uh, this section. I'm going to have a quick other section after this. Uh, many RNA 3D uh, motifs uh, can be modular. Uh, RNA make greatly simplifies the process of designing RNA structures. And I think I've demonstrated that the modularity of RNA can be approximated um, for design uh, using this the scale. Um, so I think uh, in the future, especially when we get uh, expand this out, which I'll be talking in a second, to all the motifs, I think solving these types of problems, like this HCM uh, this HCM sensor, uh, will be much easier to do. Um, so what what I'm working on right now with this project is uh, oh the it, what I showed you was uh, testing only 16 of these constructs, but I actually it, we um, actually have hundreds of thousands of these, and so what I have is I prepared a library of about 10,000 constructs uh, that uh, nicely sample all the two-way junctions, uh, uh, known two-way junctions, at least 10 times. And then we're going to use high throughput shape and next generation sequencing to get the modularity score for all known two way junctions. And I'm actually piloting this experiment right now in the current uh, Eterna uh, round. Um, so that's where that is for this project. And now I'm going to quickly talk to you about the expansion of RNA Make, uh, specifically trying to model in dynamics uh, back into RNA. So um, kind of uh, building on this idea of modularity, but now expanding it not to just static structures, but this uh, kind of modular dynamics. So uh, the system I'm going to be using is uh, this uh, te uh, tetra loop, tetra loop uh, these two tetra loop, tetra loop receptors that on the left you can see uh, kind of dimerize. Um, and specifically in this case, the, the bottom one is going to be a GAAA tetra loop receptor, and the top is going to be a GGAA uh, tetra loop receptor. Um, and these are uh, these were used uh, in this high throughput assay, which, uh, if you remember Johan's talk, uh, he, uh, his lab, uh, Will Greenleaf's lab, has developed, where it's a extremely high throughput way of um, using um, uh, <clears throat> uh, sequencing chips to uh, perform many uh, hundreds of thousands uh, of uh, FRET experiments simultaneously. And just to illustrate exactly what we're going to be looking at, one of these tetra loop receptors, uh, sorry, tectoRNAs, is going to be uh, sequenced on the chip. Um, I'm sorry, sequenced and then uh, transcribed on the chip. And then the other one is going to be this constant uh, one that we flow in with a uh, with a fluorophore on it. And we specifically are interested in looking at the variation of the binding affinity, which we can measure by how how much fluorescence there is at each point. And we're going to be changing the sequence of the one on the chip each time. And then we're going to look at the relative change in binding affinity uh, between these constructs. So uh, here's just a, just a quick example of what it's going to look like. So if you keep flowing in more of this um, of this flow piece, this this constant one with the fluorophore on it, you can see increased binding. So that that's kind of the idea. But now I'll, I'll show you exactly how I'm going to be doing the modeling. Um, so just like I discussed before, we can break this 
we can break this construct up into these uh, modular motifs where it's going to be the helices, which are in gray, the tetra and the two different tetra loop receptors. But now, instead of just keeping them as static uh, building blocks, I'm going to add in dynamics. And I'm going to do this by, uh, again, taking all the PDB, uh, PDB structures and then finding all the helical steps, which are just these two base pair units. And then if you cluster them based on how often each confirmation occurs, you can then uh, figure out the a approximation of how uh, likely each confirmation is. And then you can kind of get uh, thermodynamics out of this. Um, so that's kind of the idea. Um, and, and this is how I'm going to specifically be uh, scoring the uh, relative delta, uh, delta G, where um, while this dynamic simulation is going on, in, uh, if it's within this uh, five uh, Eggstrom RMSD cutoff uh, seen on the left, uh, the uh, account that is formed, where if it's not on, on the other side uh, for unscored, we consider that not formed. And then we can just take that. Oh, sorry. The, that's a, that's a relative del, uh, delta. Uh, de, huh? What's the, uh, K cal from all. One grid point is one k. Oh, uh, what? Yeah, uh, it's half. Is half, half k cal. Yeah, half a k cal from all. Yeah, okay. yeah. So what's the RMSD? Uh, the R, the RMSD in this fit is point four three. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Really? So yeah. it's better than that. Uh, oh, wait. Not RMSD. Point. That's just the, I'm sorry, that's the unsigned difference. So the RMSD would be lower. And then presumably yeah. there, are these yeah. breakpoints really half a KCAL or one KCAL? I'm pretty sure they're half a KCAL. Then all, almost all the points are with Oh, no, no, you're right. It's one KCAL. You're one KCAL. Okay, yeah. Sorry. I'm sorry about that. You're not going to get yeah. the block. Yeah, yeah. Over. Sorry. I just, yeah, I just took this, this slide from before. But you're right. Yeah, I did. So. Um, so in, uh, in this case, uh, we're just looking at different helical um, sequences. Um, and it's colored by how many um, uh, base pairs there are. So the red is um, just 10, which is the normal amount of base pairs, uh, where um, green, I forgot which one, green or purple, one's nine and one's uh, 11. Uh, so those will uh, be about a KCAL less stable. Yeah, it's definitely a K, yeah. You're, yeah, a KCAL less stable. And then the uh, yellow and the uh, blue are 8 and 12. And so these are even more stable. And you can see that um, using this method, you can very easily, uh, you can get some pretty precise. Uh, yellow and blues are more stable. What? Yellow and blue are less stable. Yeah. Did I say more stable? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Less stable. Less stable. Yeah. Um, so I think this is actually very exciting. Um, but the majority of the constructs that were produced uh, uh, that were looked at actually aren't just helical. They have these non-canonical motifs. And unfortunately, there's not as much PDB data for them. So we have to use like another approach. And what we decided to do is uh, use Rosetta. And uh, so specifically, we're going to use this stepwise Monte Carlo simulation, uh, which is this uh, this uh, uh, numerate one build up, uh, one residue build up at a time um, method. Uh, developed here in the DOS lab. Um, and we're going to run this, in this case, uh, hundreds of times, and then uh, cluster the final uh, structures together to build a kind of um, representative ensemble of, of these non-canonical uh, motifs. And in this case, we're just looking at single mess matches. So there's uh, it's just like an AA base pair or a GA base pair. Um, and everything else in the construct is as canonical base pairs. Um, so, uh, and here you can see on the right is uh, what the final ensemble looks like. Um, and then uh, they have about, uh, they have like 400 of these, but here is this, our, our initial, excuse me, our, uh, our initial test of about 100. And you can see that again, uh, there's some pretty, there's pretty good correlation uh, between, but not as good as just the helices. Uh, between the uh, predicted and observed. So I think this is incredibly promising, um, and we're, we're continuing uh, to work on this. Um, Do you have an explanation? Why is it yeah. typically if there's a mistake, it's in one direction? 
Yeah. The observed delta Gs are worse, like less yes. stable than predicted. That is correct. Yeah, we haven't figured it out yet. I'm trying to. That seems like some, yeah. some systematic error. I agree. We, have a, we might be able to come up with some basic proofs of what. I agree, yeah. So it's actually even, uh, I don't have a plot of it, but I have it with all 400, and it's even more pronounced. That it's systematic. It, yeah, it's, just, it's systematic, yeah. And we, uh, I haven't figured out exactly why it is yet. It could be that. Yeah. The, uh, the majority of the flexibility comes from the base pair, yeah. the normal base pairs, right? Because yes. most of this helix flopping around is canonical, and then there's just a little mismatch. That's correct, right. yeah. Mm -hmm. And you said you said you said before you had these constructs where you had added a base pair and subtracted a base pair, and again, the problem was that. Um, yeah, but I fixed that, though. But, but yeah. In that case, wasn't the, isn't there still a systematic problem where uh, uh, these RNA make predictions were too stable compared to the experiment. I'm just asking: Is this a, a problem that extends all the way to the canonical base pairs? Is that? Yeah, I'm not 100 percent sure, but we'll know in this next round because we have. But no, you yeah. must have it. Like in your previous graphs, didn't you have one where you had plus a base pair and minus yeah. a regular? Yeah, right? there. There's the blue and the yellow. Oh, oh, the plus and minus are just green and. Oh, green and magenta? Yeah, and magenta. Okay. The magenta is probably the plus. Because I remember that yeah. was the most far yeah. off. I see. So that's also your shift. It suggests yeah. that there's a, just a problem with our model of the base pair flexibility. Yeah. And so if you got a thermal ensemble of the PLCs from Cali. Yeah, which would be awesome. Yeah. Then you could start. You could. Um, yeah. So I guess the thing to do there is from what Cali was doing with the thermal sampling in Rosetta. Uh, she could give you base pair distributions for one base pair, and you could use those in your RNA make mm -hmm. for one base pair step. Yeah. But she could also produce them for like four or five base pairs at a yeah. time, and you could then um, mm -hmm. show your fragment chunks. Is that possible? Oh, yeah. You can like, those motifs or something. It can be arbitrary, it, whatever. Yeah. yeah, so then I think that would be the available comparison. So yeah. One base pair predictions, and then, or just get an ensemble for Cali, subdivide it into one base pair steps, and then. Steps. Yeah, I mean, as long as she just gives me the PVs, it's yeah. super trivial. So Might be the kind of thing where yeah. um, maybe uh, a little bit later, when there's a, more time, you could just teach Callie how to use her. Yeah, because I don't think she's learned it yet. Yeah, yeah, that's fine too. Yeah, yeah. it's really easy to set up. So I just have an application that runs it. So, so yeah, that kind of systematic error. Yeah, it's, it's totally seems like it's. Too yeah, can you go back to the old yeah. grand plot? Yeah, it would always, it's still a slope of one, though, mostly. Yeah. So if you just shifted the offset to the intercept, you could probably get a very harmonious Yeah. I mean, it's still pretty good, but yeah. It's still very good. Yeah. So, all right. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah. So, in, as you can see, so the, right now, the measurements at the worst stabilities of blue and yellow points, Yeah. they have very large error bars. Yes. Yeah. And, um, because the experiments are hard to do there. There's a weak affinity and there's not much signal of the fluorescent RNA coming down. So I'm wondering, um, so there's some kind of like a micromolar, probably on the order of a micromolar is the worst affinity that can be measured. No, I don't remember the exact, I think she just said four orders of magnitude is the absolute limit. Okay. So. And do you remember what the affinity is for the best? Is it a nanomolar roughly? No, I don't remember, sorry. So is there a problem? What if we made? What if you made this um, scaffold tighter? Like, the, so the baseline was a picomolar. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I have constructs I, I showed you that um, I made with RNA make that yeah. I hope are more stable. So they're testing that in the next round. There's an even easier way to okay. make it stable, which is to um, <clears throat> hanging off the one of the tecto RNAs, just put in a single strand region that has like oh yeah GC GC GC, and then have a base pairing region on the um, on all of the things on the right on the flow cell. No, you're right. So that immediately yeah. gives you you yeah. can basically get down to peak molar affinity. The only issue with that, so that will let you measure very very um, uh, um, cool. it'll let you measure much bigger uh, destabilizing effects. You get what I'm saying? Yeah, I get what you're saying, but would that work? Because then wouldn't you get more uh, 
non-specific binding based on yeah you wouldn't make it a long you would make it like an extra okay. five base pair watts of it. okay so that on its own it can't form on its own okay you and yeah. i can sit down right now in the yeah. states or namita and sarah can do it yeah i'm surprised you have thought of it yeah and um that'll basically yeah you're right it'll there's this possibility of just having that little extra tag yeah. bind but just having a little extra tag bind you would set it so that that affinity constant is like normal but because it's uh which is crappy which seems like yeah. really crappy but because it's in the context of these other one or two interactions that you're putting in yeah um the effect of molarity from the other interactions um uh combined with this extra little affinity tag will let you boost the affinity up to um, much much higher yeah. like to keep them all there better yeah yeah namita knows how to do the calculation. actually you should know how to do the calculation yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, 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 I don't know why we didn't think about that. The only, the only potential is if that thing is hanging off, it yeah. has the possibility of going in this folding yeah. the rest of your RNA. That's always the issue. Yeah. The other thing you could try to design is not just an additional tertiary contact. Yeah. We, we have ideas for that. Too. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. To help pin it down. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I think the uh, that would be the most elegant solution because then we wouldn't have stuff hanging off. Yeah. The hanging off thing is like, it's freezing good. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that was actually that was actually the end. Um, just kind of just wanted to, I just wanted uh, to uh, show you like a, pre a preview of this newer stuff. So I'd like to yeah thank uh, Riju uh, who uh, has speci specifically for the motif assembly stuff has, has really been critical for uh, developing the idea. Um, I'd like to thank Fong who was helping me uh, uh, at the beginning with the computational stuff. Uh, Pablo, Sichi, and Clarence for helping me uh, process the uh, shape chemical mapping data, and then Namita uh, uh, from uh, Hirschlag Group and Sarah from Will Greenleaf Group, who I'm collaborating with on the second part. So and Caleb uh, gave you the stuff I want to call. Oh yeah, and Caleb, I, I'm sorry, Caleb. I should I should add it. You added you too. Um, they was a rush to to add these two last pictures, but yeah. And of course, Caleb was critical in helping me set up the stepwise Monte Carlo uh, runs, uh, which he first produced and then taught me how to do it, which was awesome. So 